The reason it's going to be difficult, and you know in advance why it's going to be difficult, because everyone's got too much debt. On Wealth Track, an exclusive interview with outspoken former Treasury bond manager Robert Kessler. Funding provided by ClearBridge Investments, First Eagle Investments, Royce Investment Partners, Matthews Asia, Strategus Asset Management, and Women Investing in Security and Education. Hello and welcome to this edition of Wealth Track. I'm Consuelo Mack. Here's our new financial reality, which we have become all too familiar with. Higher inflation, higher interest rates, higher levels of debt among consumers, corporations, and governments, which all add up to significantly higher costs of doing business, living life, and borrowing. Now, this is not the environment in which this week's guest managed money for most of his 50-year career. In fact, it is the exact opposite. Robert Kessler was the CEO of his namesake Kessler Companies from its launch in August of 1986 until he made the decision to close the business in October of 2021. Until then, he was a manager of fixed income portfolios specializing mostly in various strategies using U.S. Treasuries for institutions and high net worth individuals around the globe. He has been an annual WealthTrack guest since our launch in 2005 and one of our most popular ones. He has been a consistent critic of Wall Street practices and groupthink, and for decades has been particularly disparaging of the street's consensus that treasury bonds were an expensive and dangerous investment, sure to bring losses to investors. Until this year, he was right about treasuries, and they were wrong. What is he saying about treasuries now? We'll find out. But first, he wanted to share his perspective on the stock market. The only time we see 20, 21, 22 days in a year where the market's going up over 2% are during bear markets. Now, the market went into a bear market, meaning whether that's right or wrong, below 20%. It's lost 20% of its value. And so technically speaking, since that point, we are in a bear market. And so the question that we deal with and your audience deals with is, okay, so what's it gonna do now? And it's kind of my job, I am somewhat older, and having been through so many of these markets, my marketplace starts in 1968. That makes me 54 years playing around in these mm -hmm. markets. Important so, perspective. So you do have a different perspective. And what's also important about that is there's a lot of misinformation that people get from the people on Wall Street who talk to them every single day. There's no better sales force, no better sales group in the world than Wall Street. So let me just start with one thing. Over the last 100 years, stocks have been incredibly the best performers. That simply right. is not true. And I'm going to show you why it's simply not true. What is and, true? But, but I want to explain why it's not true. 1968, I began. The stock market got up to 1,000, got up to 1,000 again in the 70s. This is the got Dow. To, mm -hmm. The Dow got up to 1,000 again, and it got up to 1,000. And then by 1974, it dropped 70 percent. Ah, got up to a thousand again, 1976, 1978. It didn't get over a thousand until 1982. Now that appears to be about 14 years. 1929, I want to go back to 1929 for a second. Which you is didn't before get, your time. <laughs> this is before my time, but it's part of the hundred years. So I think it's yep. important. 1929, it you were not even, even with your money with inflation till 1952. That sounds like 23 years. Plus the 14, that makes it 37 years. And then in between, we've had a number of recessions like 2009 or like 2000 or 1987, we had dropped. So I'm not even counting them. Mm -hmm. That's over one third of those 100 years. And it would be your luck and my luck, usually it works this way, when I try to get out of the market and I decide I need money, 
it's one of those 37 years. So let's stop with this nonsense that, oh no, it always works out perfect. It doesn't. It simply doesn't. Well, let me go a little bit further with this whole question. And, and this is another Wall Street thing. But I just want to reiterate, therefore, there are long periods of time when the markets are not favorable and you actually can lose money and a third of the time in the last hundred years. And you should be very aware of that, yes. that it's important to recognize that as an investor. One of the things that you also hear, and if you want to call it a myth, it's a myth, um, that, look, if you're uncomfortable and you think the stock market is going to really fall, I think you should sell maybe 25 or 35 percent of your portfolio. That'll make you more comfortable. But you don't want to sell at all because it's so difficult to get back in. You missed the big you, jumps. You, you missed, missed the doubling of the market. You right. missed the big picture because the market from 2009 to now has actually gone up almost 400 percent. So you missed it. Mm -hmm. But the thinking is that if you get rid of all your stock, hey, I think that the market's going to look like 1968 to 1982. That's a long time. Be nice to have cash. 1929 to 1952. Be nice to have cash. Okay, but you only sold 25 and you'll never get back in if you sell it all. Now, that is completely and totally ridiculous, and this is the reason why. I think what's important about that 25% that we talked about or going to 100% cash, I think it's important that all of you sleep well at night. Now, I know this is a little bit beyond Wall Street pattern, but I think it, for me, and, and of course I am a little bit older, um, one of the things that makes me sleep a little bit better is when I don't have to watch the stock market every single day. I want to make a point about cash for a moment. One of the things you hear all the time is cash is trash. You know, you don't want yes. to cash. This is and you've criticized this, many on Wall Street for saying cash is trash over the years. Yes, it, 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 it is important to have cash. And the people who tell you cash is trash, let's get this straight, are always billionaires. Now, I don't know about these billionaires, and they may have $10 million in cash and all the rest of their billions of dollars, which represent a great deal, are in stocks or some other place. They sleep at night very well. We would sleep much better if we were in cash right now. And I have a list, very seldom do this, but I actually have a list of things to worry about. In 2006, 2007, 2008, 2009, there were a series of things that happened, and then suddenly, one day we woke up, it was a Monday morning, as a matter of fact, over the weekend, Lehman went bankrupt. Lehman caused a freezing of all the banks in the world. Right. And suddenly the world was upended. No Did liquidity. We, and, and, no, and you told me there's liquidity until there isn't. And that was a, a there isn't moment. And in fact, today, you hear that there's just a wave of money just ready to come into this market, just sitting there, all that money. And that liquidity is all the, and you know what that liquidity is from? It's from very cheap money. It's money that people can borrow cheaply, and suddenly, wow, they have a lot of money, until suddenly those bankers, and we know those bankers, we, I mean me, when I go in and I have a lot of money, the bank wants to give me everything I want. It's amazing. When I don't have any money, the bank gives me nothing. That's how bankers are. Well, mm -hmm. that's exactly how this wall of money and liquidity works. When everything is cheap and everything's fine, you get to refinance and refinance and refinance. And let's take what really is important here, and that is that 20% of the Russell 2000, that's 20%, that is a huge number, are technically zombie companies. They don't have enough money to run on a daily basis. Right, but, they have no earnings. Mm -hmm. but Rates are low, money is cheap, 
and so they can borrow every single day until they can't. Now on your list of big worries is indebtedness. Where are you most concerned about the debt levels? Well, let me, let me, let me tell you where the great indebtedness is. Mm -hmm. So emerging markets, emerging markets have trillions of dollars that are coming due, not in 30 years, but they're coming due now. Coming due this year, next year, the year after. So they're, they're very short term. And, and if you stop and think about it, you don't really want to give long term money to companies that don't look very good. So you give them short term money. Give me back the money and maybe I'll give you more. Okay, well they're on the give me more time. And they have to do it in dollars because that's how they borrow the money. The dollar is actually up and it's higher than it's been for the last several decades, decades. And suddenly versus, all these companies. Versus the other currencies. Versus right. the other currency. And suddenly all these companies, these emerging markets, have to return the money in dollars and they need new money, otherwise can't be in business. What's important about that is what happens if they don't pay? Hmm. They default. Defaults have been very low. And why have the defaults been very low? Because money is very cheap. And so suddenly you have a possibility that there'll be a major default among all the emerging markets. But that's not the big problem. The real big problem is us, the United States. Right, the U.S. government, right. How big a problem? You who have you know, managed portfolios of treasury securities for decades, how big a problem is the indebtedness of the U.S. government? It is a very strange thing. It's again, as long as everything's cheap, get to borrow money. The United States government is in debt for something like $31 trillion, some enormous number. None, none of us even know what that, I don't know what that means. It's the highest that it's been since World War II or something, right? It's not really that high. Let me tell you why. Because it's really a function of like a house. It's like a mortgage. If your house is worth a million dollars and you have 30% is your mortgage, that's not a big thing. Well, in the United States, we actually have something from the Federal Reserve. They tell us we are worth, as of today, just this is a number, about $137 trillion. But if we have $31 trillion in debt and $137 trillion in assets, doesn't sound like such a big number. In 2009, 2009 uh, to bail out the country, we raised $700 billion. We had to go to Congress, Federal Reserve, the Treasury. Everyone went to Congress and had to beat everyone up to get $700 or $800 billion. Billion, we saved, not trillion. Billion, billion, right. billion. We saved the country. We just had a pandemic. We laid out three, four, five, six trillion dollars. Sent $1,000 here, $2,000 here. Bailed out this company, bailed out that company. But what, these numbers don't mean anything to anyone. The Federal Reserve does not have a great track record. They weren't so good when the rates were low. I don't know why they were so low, but they were. And now everyone thinks, okay, we can fix inflation by raising the rates to 5%. Even though the inflation is not caused by demand, it's caused by a lack of supply because of the pandemic. So is the Fed right or wrong? I don't know, that is not my job. But that's where we are, the Fed is raising. So that's very serious. So what I tried to do for this program, if I can, is I tried to list all these things that might tell us, when is that gonna happen? Well, even though I can name all those things, yeah, crypto is down and SPACs are down and all these ridiculous things are down, just like the dot-com was down and that, that's not it. We don't know what that big bang will be that shuts this operation down, but it will happen. And the terrible thing about it happening is how long it takes. So the it that you're talking about is what? The type of event that we talk about is something that will freeze up the markets that normally work 
uh, extremely well, and that always is the banking system. I will add very quickly that one of the things we always say, never matters what happens, the banks are in good shape. That, yes, uh, that's what we're told. That is our favorite thing. This time, this not last time, because the last time it was subprime, and the banks owned too much of that subprime stuff that wasn't any good. That Ben Bernanke, that was the head of our Federal Reserve, said housing prices never come down. That was not a very smart thing to say because, of course, they all fell apart. Right now, we say the banking industry is in terrific shape. This time, we have no problem. There's only one problem. None of us have a clue to what's on their balance sheets. It is very, very complicated. Our banking system and the products we sell are made by very brilliant people who know how to make everything that we don't understand. And so they're all sitting there, they're all sitting there, and they pop. Something happens. What that is, I don't know, and nor does anyone else, but it will be something now. To bring it down to kind of what we should do with our money, again, I'm hearing a couple of things. Uh, one, if the U.S. government is so indebted, even though you're saying it's not as big a problem as people think it is, but, um, and in fact, their borrowing costs have gone up by many multiples and will go up by many multiples more. You know, how are treasuries going to do in that environment? So, it's good that you bring up treasuries because um, treasuries were the first in, meaning the first that really went down in value and, and, and down in price. The rates went up, treasuries went down. Right. They have to be the first because the Fed raises, treasuries go with the raise. So that happens first. Usually the first in becomes the first out. So what will happen, no different than 2009, no different than 2001 two, no different than any other period of time I can think of, the Fed reaches a point, which they haven't, reaches a point that they stop. And they sit at that point. They stop raising rates. They stop right. raising rates and they sit there at that high rate. It's not until sometime after that, that means if they reach that point, let's just say in February, the average period of time before they actually lower is around 11 months. The tendency is that the Fed sits there at that high rate for another 11 months. That's when Lehman happened, 11 mm -hmm. months later. How is that? So assuming that the Fed is going to come down, and I make this up, next November, mm -hmm. you could bet that someplace August or around there, the Treasuries will be coming down two or three months before the Fed finally does lower. Assuming the Fed gets to five, let's just assume they get to five. The I, Fed funds I, right. I, I, mm -hmm. Make it an assumption. They, I don't think they will. I don't think they'll get anything near there. But let's assume they do. Treasuries would go up to about 475. It's where they kind of trade. And then they go down. And they're the first to go down. It's at that point that the stock market collapses. Why? Because it's at that point that the Fed is beginning to realize, oh my God, it's time we do something. That's what the, so it doesn't happen right away. So if, if I can impart anything from my experience in, into this interview, it's that you have to have patience. That's why I say that if you think it's going to be that long a period of time, which it will be, then being in cash is a good thing. So you recently retired, and what's your portfolio positioning? Are you 100% in cash? Are you I have long-term treasuries, because I like treasuries. Uh -huh. They're paying me. In fact, you don't have to buy a long-term treasury. Buy a two-year treasury, it pays you 4.5%. What the heck, not so bad. Go to sleep at night, you know it's gonna pay you in the period of two years. And just I roll have... it over when it matures? Sure, nothing, Mission nothing. Free. There's nothing wrong with four and a half percent. Mm -hmm. That mm -hmm. sounded, that's like a CD in the bank. We used to get CDs. Okay, I also own some long-term treasuries. Because if the long-term treasury is going to be, I'll make this up, five percent, and it went down to one, the Fed will probably go back to zero anyway. We were at zero. How, how can we support all this debt 
if we pay a 4%, we can't. We can't. But what that means for the long-term treasury is every point it comes down, every point is worth roughly 16% plus the 4.5% you're getting or the 5 or whatever it is. That's pretty good. So the whole point is you're saying you've got to wait for all of these shoes to drop before we get there, where actually the cycle turns. We will get to zero. There, there is no way companies that we all know, companies that need to borrow money, can afford to pay 10%, 8%, 7%, even 4%. They can't. So we'll bring it to zero. Is that a good idea? No. Is that the right idea? I don't know. But that's what will happen. It sounds like a major recession is what you think we are in for. I, I think we're going to have something that is this 13, 14, 15 year period of time that mm -hmm. you're not going to make any money. Mm -hmm. Except on what? You'll make some money initially on the long term treasury. Yes, I think you will. And yes, Hopefully you're a plumber or an electrician because you probably are working all the time. But it's going to be a very difficult period of time. And the reason it's going to be difficult, and you know in advance why it's going to be difficult, because everyone's got too much debt. Robert, one investment for a long-term diversified portfolio, what's left of it? <laughs> what would it be? Look, pay off the mortgage in your house. Pay off the debt you have. Each one of those things is costing you more than you're going to get on your investment. Your credit card costs 19 percent. Do you really think you're going to make 19 percent in the stock market again? Do you really think paying your mortgage off is, is such a bad idea? You, you sleep pretty good at night. So yes, for, for change, this is a little bit different than I've said in the past. What I'm saying now is put your house in order. This is not going to be a, a good period of time in front of us. If you don't have a job that really works perfectly in every environment, then think about it. Think, think about getting rid of debt. Treasury securities have typically been considered a safe haven investment. They have been considered a non-correlated investment in that when stock market goes down, they will hold their value at least or go up. Is that still the case? Yeah, I, I, it's an interesting point because there is no other asset class, none. There isn't one you can name, nor can anyone on Wall Street name another asset class that does as well as treasuries do when things turn bad. Great. Robert Great. Kessler, thank you so much for <laughs> taking <laughs> time to appear on Wealth Track. Hey, come on, I put on a jacket. Thank you very, very much for having me on Consuelo. At the close of every Wealth Track, we try to give you one suggestion to help you build and protect your wealth over the long term. This week's action point involves a tried and true strategy of building yourself a dependable stream of income over the years, which works for any age but is particularly valuable for retirees in a rising interest rate environment. So this week's action point is consider building a laddered treasury bond portfolio. You can do it online and free of fees. Laddering means buying a portfolio of bonds that mature at different times of your choosing. Starting with short-term maturity, say two-year bonds at the lowest rungs, intermediate term ones maturing in say five years in the middle rungs, and ending with long-term ones, 10-year maturities at the highest rungs. When the shortest term bond matures, you buy a new 10-year bond with the proceeds, always replacing the highest rung. And as bonds mature over the years, money goes to purchase new bonds with longer maturities within the range of the bond ladder. The U.S. Treasury has made this kind of strategy easy and inexpensive through its online marketplace, treasurydirect.gov, where you can buy new treasury issues at no commission. Every month, the Treasury auctions two, three, five, seven, 10, 20, and 30 year issues, which gives you plenty of choices. Interest payments are made semi annually and they are free from state and local taxes. 
Thanks to the latter, you can diversify the interest rates you receive, insulate yourself from dramatic ups and downs in the bond market, and keep up with interest changes in the short end while getting more stable income returns at the longer end. And at any time, you can take the cash from the maturing bond and use it as income. Next week, a WealthTrack TV exclusive with Charles Ellis, who has been called Wall Street's wisest man. He shares 60 years of investment wisdom collected in his new book, Figuring It Out. We are in for a treat. In this week's extra feature, Robert Kessler has retired from bond management, but he hasn't from serious rock climbing. Why Kessler keeps climbing. Please follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and our YouTube channel. Thanks for spending time with us. Have a super weekend and make the week ahead a healthy, profitable, and productive one. Thank you.